Awesome. Okay. We're in business. My, my screen froze up there for a second. I guess it doesn't like all this uh, great new technology, which we do find um, when we're running our experiments in the field that sometimes it doesn't always work and you got to stop and figure out what's going on. So the first thing you should notice today is that I am not Jackie Dresser. So Jackie is a technician here um, with the Efficient Vineyard Project and she is out on assignment right now. So I am stepping in for her to give this webinar. Uh, but I do have Kevin Martin here to my right. So if I'm Jackie in the middle and Kim Knappenberger to my left, Kim is manning the computer. So if you have anything you want to say in the chat box or ask a question, uh, Kim's going to, you know, punch me in the head and, and tell me to answer that question for you. And Kevin's going to be here to talk a little bit about the economics of, of yield monitoring. So today's topic is about yield monitoring. Um, I'm not going to talk necessarily about crop estimation. That will be a different webinar. Uh, we're just talking about the, the tools we use to evaluate or sense crop size uh, in the vineyard. So this is a picture of Ted Taft, a longtime employee here of Cornell University. He's done a lot of viticulture research with us. And of course, he's very skeptical of the new technology because he's used to running small field trials with us and where we measure, we pick and weigh uh, the fruit off of every vine and with, a, with a, basically a spring scale there, a fish scale. Uh, so he says there's nothing more precise than that than to pick the fruit off of every vine and weigh it and then you have an accurate count of what's going on. But of course, that's very difficult to do when we're in our commercial blocks and you need to do that on, on every vine or, every, or a set of vines to give us a yield pattern throughout that vineyard. So today I want to talk a little bit about what we do to try to come up with this kind of yield map. Uh, I like to show this image. It's, um, it's a vineyard here at the lab. It's on a slope towards the back of the property. And I think this is a five acre block of grapes and it's got a low spot. So the not only in this particular case, the vines at the lower end of that field are in a heavier and much wetter soil. So again, this is, you know, New York viticulture, unirrigated, we rely on rainfall. And at the low end of that field, the soil gets pretty wet, the vines are a little bit weaker. And in this case, because they're at a lower elevation, we also had some frost damage. But well, we picked that up very nicely on the yield map, and we'll talk about the yield, the yield um, sensors that we use on our harvester to get to that point. Okay, so summary for today. Uh, where are we in the webinar series? Again, since I'm not Jackie, I'm, I'm the project manager for the Efficient Vineyard Project. <clears throat> so I wanna give you kind of a, a, a overall, arching, overarching picture of where we are in the webinar series, where we are in the project, um, and where we are with the yield sensing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, then we're going to talk about actual the measuring of yield spatially with our yield monitors, a little bit about data resolution and, and some questions and discussions at the end if there is any. Okay, so measure, so the whole project is built off of this measure, model, manage concept um, in vineyard management. So what we're trying to do is we're measuring stuff. So like Jackie's already talked about, we're looking at soil, canopy, and crop characteristics. And we're trying to either use off-the-shelf sensors or develop new sensors that give us an indication of spatial measurement of soil characteristics, canopy characteristics, or crop characteristics. And of course, today it's all about yield monitoring. Uh, and then we take that data, which is just an electronic signal from some sensor, and we need to validate that into, into some viticulture measurement that means something to us from a management standpoint. So the whole measure thing is, what sensors are you gonna use, and then how are you gonna stratify your manual samples against that to look at the relationships and change that electronic map into a viticulture map. Uh, then we model, so I look at modeling as two different things. One is uh, data modeling. So what we really want to do is we want to use multi-data layering um, to look at at any point or section of the vineyard, you know, what's the soil like, what's the canopy like, what's the crop like, can I use that in a crop load balance model and be able to, to understand or come up with management decisions for that particular section of the vineyard. Then there's um, at the viticulture or horticulture modeling of what am I after in the vineyard? Am I just, do I just compare? So am I just worried about vine growth? Am I worried about yield or yield components? Am I worried about fruit quality? Am I worried about all of them? Uh, in my case, I'm, I do a lot of work with vine balance. So looking at the leaf area to fruit weight ratio or the yield to pruning weight ratio, which is a, another webinar we'll talk about crop load 
modeling. And so how do we use that data to do multi-data layer, multi-data layer processing and come up with a management map that means something to us viticulturally, uh, be able to apply variable rate management. So the last part is about managing, which really has two parts. One is the integration of hardware, software, and data integration. So again, we're using sensors, that's, that sensor data needs to be validated and processed, and we integrate those into multi-data layer processing, and then variable rate applications. How, we, how are we actually going to use that spatial data to manipulate our machines in the vineyard, uh, or how do we ma manipulate the action of the workers in the vineyard, if you're not using machines, to change uh, how things are happening in, in the vineyard? So where we are, so far in the webinar series is Jackie has talked about soil and soil sensing in, in one of the, the webinars, I think the first one or the second one. Uh, then she talked about NDVI. Uh, we use ground-based NDVI sensors mounted on a, to vineyard machines, but she also talked about um, stuff that we get from drones or flyovers or satellites, you know, what is NDVI? How can we use it? How can we validate NDVI measurements to give us an idea of canopy growth and light interception? Uh, and then today we'll be talking about yield monitoring. So again, we're using on a machine, two different yield monitors. One is a load cell that is on the belt of the cross conveyor and then another one is an impact plate and Kevin will be here to talk a, a little bit about the economics of each of those. And then finally crop sensing, working with our Carnegie Mellon uh, cooperators, they've developed this image analysis system. So they're looking at non-destructive yield monitoring. So the, the big push this year was to look at how we could use that image sensor to look at yield components non-destructively throughout a vineyard. So uh, we actually, we start right with pruning weight uh, in the dormant season. Then early season, we're looking at shoot counts. Then we're looking at cluster counts. We're looking at berry counts and then berry size. So looking at the different yield components and how accurate that image sensing unit from Carnegie Mellon can be used to measure those yield components non-destructively in a vineyard. Okay, so that'll be another webinar, um, probably the next one or the one after that. Okay, the next couple of slides, there's about 10 slides here that Jackie added. Um, she gave, in the winter conference, she gave a wonderful speech on vineyard mechanization and the development of vineyard mechanization. So it doesn't have a lot to do with our yield monitoring other than some uh, interesting historical facts about how mechanical harvesting developed. Um, and there'll, there'll be a point to this when I get through them. But the point is I'm going to breeze through like the next 10 slides. Um, I'll probably stay on each slide long enough. So if you view this webinar later, you can stop and read everything there is about the history um, of, of harvester development. But again, like we argue with most of this precision ag agriculture work or vineyard mechanization work, we're talking about the, the uh, the quantity and quality and the cost of vineyard labor that's out there. So we used to be able to do everything by hand and now we're using machines to reduce the cost and be more efficient with our time. Um, and so there's this argument, you know, who developed the first mechanical harvester? So back in 1958, there was some work done on, on mechanical harvesting. It was through UC Davis. So there's this, you know, did, did New York or California come up with the first mechanical harvester? Uh, this design was actually never commercialized, um, but it was first worked on in California. Then in 1966, there was some work done at Gallo, uh, looking at like vacuums to suck up clusters, another version of mechanical harvesting. And then in 1967, uh, Shepardson and Nelson Chalice, who's a viticulturist out in our region, worked on developing a first mechanical harvester. There's a picture of the first prototype there. Um, and really had these horizontal shakers that went up under a GDC vine and, and knocked off the fruit. Uh, and then there was some more development by Burton, which then led to the whole Chisholm Rider thing with them starting mechanical harvesting. As I said, I'm just breezing through these slides. You can check them out. Um, a really cool guy that we got to interview a few weeks ago, um, Roy Orton, so Joseph R. Orton, 
Roy Orton is a grape grower here in the Ripley area, so in western New York, and he has the patent on one of the first harvesters that um, were used in this region. And we, this interview is really cool because he talked about some of the first developments of that mechanical harvester using actual full sheets of plywood to shake the vines and get some of the fruit to knock off. Um, and then Chisholm Rider came up with the self-propelled unit, again, using shaker rods throughout the entire canopy. Um, and then there's all these variations in collection systems. And then with all the developments coming up today's harvester. So my point is this, that the, most of the harvesters that we use today are machines that use a shaker head, whether that's bow rods or a trunk shaker that shakes the fruit off the vines onto the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt goes across the row and then we'll go into a gondola or bin. Um, or in some cases, there's a bin right on the harvester, a side discharge bin that, that the grapes will go into. And so that leads us to where we can, okay, what can we do about measuring yield that's coming off of the harvester and where are the points um, on the harvester, the conveyor of that fruit, where we can get an idea of yield. So back in 2008 and 2009, uh, we started some work here at Cornell looking at sonic sensors uh, with a local engineer in the Westfield area. Uh, and so the, the sonic, if you can, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but over the cross conveyor belt, there's this little blue, um, can you see that? yeah, so there's this little blue sensor and there's actually, we use two different sonic sensors in this case. Um, and that's pointing down at the belt. And really what you're getting with the sonic sensor is, is you're getting the volume of grapes going across the belt. And, and that, it did, um, again, from a relative standpoint that worked. Um, some of the downfalls are that if you're working with different varieties, that that signature is going to be different. And if the belt gets too full, you're going to saturate that signal. So maps look something like this. This is a, a Concord vineyard. So again, you're getting the volume of grapes going across the belt. That's going to change with variety. Um, we really didn't do much more work on the sonic sensor other than we had it. Um, the advantages were that it was relatively inexpensive. Um, you got nice relative yield maps. And we really stopped work on doing a lot of validation with it, like you know, attributing what is the electronic signal to the actual tonnage that was out there. Uh, because most people, again, with this idea that the volume of grapes, so if I'm picking Concord and then I turn around and I'm picking Riesling like two weeks later, that the difference in the berry size is gonna change that signature of volume going across the belt and that there, if you could get a signal of weight, that would be more accurate. So uh, we started working with ATV, so Advanced Technology Viticulture, so that's Bern Kleinagel out of Australia, uh, designed this load cell yield monitor sensor that goes under the belt. So you basically cut out a section of the belt um, or a section of the pan underneath the belt and you have a false waveframe. There's four load cells that are on there. And as that the belt rides over the weighing mechanism, you're getting an um, electric signal. So there's Burned. So, so Burned is the guy that basically uh, runs and supports this system. So if you want one installed on your harvester, you have to call them up and have them come over from Australia. Uh, install it and calibrate it and, and, and have support from him. Um, and here is, so this is back in 2012, we had one put on our harvester and that's um, the Betts machine. I think I see that Bob Betts is on the, online. So that's in their barn, having Burn come over and install one on, on their machine as well. So uh, the video shows here just, you know, during harvest, again, those grapes are running over the belt that False waveframe is picking up the, the weight or a signature of the grapes going across the belt. And it goes into so the, the picture of the monitor itself, that gray box there at the bottom is the second generation. Um, so what, so I guess the advantage is, is that it, it works. You know, we've tested it and we've validated it and it works. The, some of the disadvantages are that that box that you see will, it gives you a, increasing tally of the weight that's coming off. So you're getting, so as you pick an entire load, you just see the weight um, just continue to go up as you're, as you're picking. You're not seeing a display of like how, many, 
you know, what's your tonnage that you're harvesting at that particular moment. Um, it is recording all that spatial data onto an SD card. You have to pull that SD card out. You pop it into your computer and you use the, his software, Burns ATV software, to convert that and be able to um, either map it directly off of the software or import it into, say, ArcGIS or some other spatial data program that you use and then be able to map your yield. As I said, we've, we've done quite a bit of work validating this, so we've used it at, for those of you who understand what we do for crop estimation in Concord at 30 days after bloom, where we lay out a rope that's 1% of an acre and you clean pick that rope and weigh the fruit, we've been using the ATV yield monitor at that time, um, looking at, so when we clean pick that 1% of an acre, we weigh the fruit and, and it's, we're getting a nice, like linear relationship between the amount of fruit that's actually there and what the yield monitor is saying. Uh, we also have some, uh, you know, field trials, mechanization field trials, where we'll pick half rows into bins and weigh those. Again, we're matching those up with the yield monitor and have very nice relationships. And then finally, probably more important for the industry is taking truck weights at the end of the year. So, so again, we go into a vineyard, we pick that vineyard, it goes onto a truck, the truck goes to the scale house and gets weighed. And we get the waste slip from that, we match it back up to what the yield monitor says. Um, again, getting nice relationships. And at that point, we can turn our ATV electric signal map into an actual yield map because we know what the final yield weight is. So we basically, we calibrate that map. Uh, another yield monitor that we are evaluating is an impact plate type, which is now commercially going to be sold or is sold by Oxbow. Um, so this is, this is kind of a, you know, like some, like a lot of our technology that we're using on this project, it's coming from work that's been done in the Midwest um, in other areas of precision agriculture. So this is uh, the type of technology that has come off of grain harvesters. It's an impact plate. So it, in this case, as, the grapes are coming off of the belt. They're hitting that, that plate, and that plate is hooked up to a strain gauge, and, and so you're getting a signal. So the more grapes that are going across, the larger the signal that you get, and you can use that to calibrate with your yield. Uh, so this, again, is it's sold by Oxbow. It's an option on all their new models, and they have a kit that you can hook up to older models. And Kevin's going to talk about economics here in a minute, so I'll skip that part. Uh, so we've compared these two. So we have both both systems running at the same time on our harvester, and this is some of the yield maps coming off of the blocks of our research farm. Um, if you look to the right, the it really shows the difference between the two displays. So the ATV, you have this basically a data logger. Um, you're getting the spatial data, and you can you can watch the total yield go up, um, but you're not getting instantaneous yield. The Oxbow system will feed right into Ag Leader and the Ag Leader SMS software on your field computer. So as you're picking, you can get you can also get it instantaneous. So you get, it's a there's advantages because you can actually see what the harvest map looks like as it's being built. Um, again, and I think that you know it's not the next slide. So you'll hear a lot of us say that the yield monitors are a monitor, not a scale. It doesn't, it doesn't become a scale until you get some validation measurement of what you took off the vines. So whether that be bin weights or truck weights, you know, it's just a relative map. And if you, for example, if you weigh some bins at the beginning of the day and maybe weigh some bins in the middle of the day and you have a good idea that your, your yield monitor is calibrated, then you can be somewhat confident that what you're seeing on the screen is an actual, the actual yield, right? So <laughs> I even want to know this. It's like when you're looking at the map, you're saying, oh, okay, I have higher yield here and lower yield there. And I want to know exactly what those yield measurements are. Uh, the only way to get that is to calibrate it. But at some point you're just, you're in the middle of the day, you're like, yeah, we've calibrated it once or twice. It's good. There might be some drift during the day, um, but most of us, when we're out in the field actually harvesting and we're seeing those numbers go up or down, um, we're pretty happy with what we see coming off of the, the yield monitor, right? 
So I know if I'm picking six tons per acre, yeah, I'm pretty much around six tons per acre. I'm not at nine or I'm not at two or something like that, which could really throw you off. Um, I don't really know that much. This is something that Jackie added. So there's a Neo map, Gregoire Neo map. So the Gregoire has a version. There's a, she's got a video embedded on this. This is not one that I've worked with. So there's a video going here. So I think it works fairly similar to the ATV where you've, you've got the grapes are coming off of a belt, going over onto a false waveframe, which is then uh, recording an electric signal that you can convert into a weight. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. He's gonna talk a little bit about the economics. So this is a really interest, interesting topic for sensors because uh, I think when we started this project, um, the, the sensors that were available were not very commercialized at, at the time of the beginning of the project when we were doing our pilot study. And it's really come a long way since 2008. Uh, Oxbow, as has been mentioned a couple times, has a sensor that's available on new harvesters uh, that they've kind of borrowed from the corn industry. Uh, that sensor itself is going to run about $7,000. And then it's another 7,500 for a high quality GPS, which they're including and, um, and a, basically a data logger, more than a data logger. What you see in the image is, a, is an Ag Leader 1200. Um, what would be included would be a, an Oxbow branded Ag Leader 800, uh, which would be more than, an, more than enough computing power to just do yield monitoring. It's possible for some of our smaller growers, uh, they were not sure how they were gonna market this device yet, uh, but it might be available with just the sensor as, as a lot of growers may want to share that, that uh, tractor computer and may already own one. Uh, so they may not need one or, and they may not need the GPS for the harvester itself. Uh, so that could bring the cost down significantly. It's also possible that they're actually gonna use that Ag Leader 800 to control uh, functions on the harvester in the future. So it may just end up being included because it's required to control the harvester and it will, it will come with all Oxbow harvesters and the sensor will just be an addition to that as well as the GPS. Uh, the Gregoire is a little bit more limited in that it was specifically developed for grape harvesting. Uh, and right now it's only going to be available, I believe they're calling it the GLS-8, I think, so that's a new harvester that's coming out in 2019. Uh, in our area, most growers use a G9, um, so they would not be using this type of harvester, particularly with a dual bin machine. So that video that showed um, the false waveframe, it's actually a fairly long waveframe, and it's it's uh, on the main right underneath the main conveyor belt. So there's two of them on the harvester. Uh, which is why it's only available on a dual bin machine. They don't have anything yet for a, a, a harvester that's equipped with a discharge conveyor. So that's going to limit some of the application, I think, particularly in Australia and in this part of the U.S., because we tend to use discharge conveyors in a, in a lot of our vineyards. Uh, there's a local dealer developing one for a G9, and there are also people doing sort of do-it-yourself type sensors with, with load cells and impact plates to equip uh, to equip G9 and other Gregoire harvesters with yield monitors. Um, there are, there's also work in Europe with o Oxbow, or I shouldn't say Oxbow, with, um, with load cells, with impact plates on other types of harvesters. So I think these are going to be commercially available on pretty much every harvester in the next five or six years, even though it looks slightly limited right now. ATV, I always type that wrong because I type it correctly and then I assume it's not a four-wheeler, so I must be wrong, but it is ATV. Uh, I think we went over the fact that that was $17,000 installed. Um, data processing is a little bit trickier with, with the ATV. Uh, it is not necessarily useful in season uh, or, or on the fly, I guess, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the benefits of that and, and how we can make ATV work uh, in a way that's that's good enough if it's a if it's the only or if it's what you need on your operation um, 
So one of the things that yield monitor can do pretty well is just give a manager a report card. So when we start looking at very large wineries and very large vineyards, they may not really have a good idea of why a block is performing the way it performs. And this may not even be used all the time for variable rate management, but may really just be used to, to determine what's going on in an individual block and make some management decisions that relate to yield. And I think that's where a lot of growers are really excited about yield monitors. We haven't really studied the cost benefit of having a report card, uh, but it is certainly uh, something that managers are interested in. Um, in terms of order of cost benefit and what our priorities are, I think yield works, yield data is, is what can be well integrated into the whole sensor suite. So for example, using it to manage your crop load is really important. And, and I think that's where we've started to demonstrate a real return on investment. Um, remedial action. So if a manager decides to target a particular area for vine size rehabilitation or renewal or some other type of either by hand or variable rate mechanically action, uh, yield monitor can be an, yield data can be an important layer to use. Uh, variable rate potassium is, is an area that, that is certainly possible and could add value, but the rate of return on that is going to be relatively small. So in our area, one of the things that where we can really benefit and where we've shown a benefit in Concords is 30 days post bloom, we go out and thin and we hope for a higher quality product as a result of thinning when things are overcropped. Um, we do a pretty good job on research vineyards of seeing a good response from large vines uh, being thinned down from a, an extremely large crop to a large crop and we get high quality fruit, we get a good return crop and there's a real solid benefit there. And that's with or without a yield monitor. In a commercial setting, uh, the results in 2013 and 2014 that we mixed, that we, that we looked at, um, were, were a little more mixed. And we looked at this to see from a baseline perspective where the industry was with thinning without a yield monitor. Uh, we saw return crops that were 50% larger, uh, all the way down to no larger uh, when growers thinned. And if you look at those three green bars that are like right around 5% or 2% of an increase, uh, those are basically over thinned vineyards. Uh, one of them was under thinned and two of them were over thinned, but, but essentially those were mistakes in the thinning process that could have been avoided with a yield monitor. Uh, un and in 2013 and 2014, uh, the 2014 return crop year, we were severely overcropped in all, almost all of our vineyards. So you can see where every grower had areas that we measured unthinned um, grapes, the return crop was pretty miserable in the large majority of those cases. You could see a couple where the return crop was pretty healthy, but that was, that was the exception rather than the rule. Uh, the other image is an image of the Betts field trial where they ended up thinning certain areas as a result of having access to some of this data. Without this data, they have said that they would not have thinned that block. And the results were really positive. The, uh, the return crop was much larger than we expected uh, on the order of 100% uh, to 150% of what we took off was returned in the following year. And, and to put that in terms of what actually happened is we took off about a ton and a half, a ton and a half and the return crop was almost double that in, in some of those areas. So we were really able to prevent some of the mistakes that are associated with commercial thinning. And in doing so, we saw a benefit in that block of pretty close to $200 per acre because of the increase in, in yield from the return crop. And this was orders of magnitude less than 2013. There, there was not a situation where there was a severe overcrop here. Uh, this was a situation where the grower was really comfortable with the amount of yield and was just kind of very lightly tinkering with the yield to, to get a very nice balanced crop. Uh, so the potential for the economic value to increase in a year like 2013 would be much more substantial. So we can certainly see years where uh, in a very normal year, we could see a benefit of a, a grower in our area uh, of twenty to $40,000 by doing a very small amount of thinning. Uh, in a year like 2013 to 2014, over those those two crop cycles, we could see that easily double. And it's because we see a lot of mistakes in commercial thinning. 
Um, I think that's I think that's about it. The only other thing I would say is the integration with the other sensors is really what's going to be a key component of adding value with with this kind of data. And just having a yield monitor, although it's easy to commercialize that way because you, the next harvester you buy may have one, uh, you're probably not going to see a lot of a lot of added value in, until you start measuring other other things like NDVI. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, okay, hope everyone's doing okay out there. Please, if you have any questions, uh, zip them off to Kim and she'll let me know. Uh, so there was a really good question out there, Kim Martinson, very astute guy. Um, notice that on this slide that the yield, the two yield maps weren't necessarily identical, which is, that's a very great observation. That's something that we're looking at. Um, so when you look at these two maps and then we, we collect that spatial data and we do a correlation between the two, the correlation between the two yield monitors is very high, right? So it's like correlation coefficient of like 0.85 or 0.9, something basically saying that the two maps are the same, but why do they look different? The, um, and we're again, we're still looking at this. So don't take this as the, um, the, the, the dead end truth. Uh, but what I think what we're seeing here is that the Oxbow impact plate, we are catching more of the high highs and more of the low lows, right? So we're getting, we're picking up the, the, a larger spread in the data, which to me is a real spread in the data. So it's picking up um, where the crop might be excessively low and, and it actually is registering numbers there and also very high. So when we map the two out, they're going to, the maps are going to look slightly different. The overall patterns are going to be fairly similar, again, with that high correlation coefficient. But you can see, like on the Oxbow, if you look at the edge effect, when it enters and exits a row, you're picking up um, some lower numbers. And I think those that might be real in some cases. Um, so I think we're just picking up a, a larger spread in the data. Uh, again, so uh, I think bottom line for me, that both yield monitors work. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages with each. Um, for me, you know, as a practitioner, I really like just that the Oxbow one can hook up to the Ag Leader system. I can see what's going on in real time. Um, if there was a way, and this is this, you know, uh, Burned is one of those guys that if you ask him questions about developments and that, that he will take that into consideration. If there was a way for the ATV data to be streamed into like an SMS software uh, on the fly, you're going to get the same thing. But the components of the yield monitor to me, whether it's a, a waveframe or an impact plate, um, they seem to be performing both fairly well. So I hope that answers that question. More questions. All right. Uh, okay. Just uh, another couple points that Jackie wanted me to make about calibration. So you'll, if you ever hear me talk about this project, you're going to hear me say the words validation, 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 because I think it's somewhere that practitioners fall down on. Like, if you just want a sensor that's going to go out and tell you everything, you're going to be waiting a long time for it to actual hap actually happen. Um, you know, the only way to really know what's going on is to be able to take those validation measurements. Um, with yield monitors, we're usually looking at some basic, you know, zeroing of the yield monitor on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe multiple times, you know, as you're starting new blocks. Um, we really like to do, especially on a research basis, we will collect bin weights or truck weights on a regular basis and, and um, calibrate that back to the yield monitor data. That's the only way we really know what the actual numbers were at the end of the day. Um, so, I, yeah, the point is, validate your measurements. <laughs> Whether that's NDVI measurements or yield monitor measurements or trying to validate a spatial soils map, uh, the only way to really know what's going on is to take some observations. You know, the stuff you learned in eighth grade science still holds true today, I guess. Um, okay, Jackie also wanted me to mention something about resolution. So one of the big advantages about using yield monitor is that you're getting a high resolution data set, right? You're getting a high very dense data set, which then can be used to visualize your spatial yield map um, when you go through the spatial data processing, which again, the, the whole process that we use for spatial data processing, we'll, we'll talk about in an upcoming webinar. 
Uh, but we'll get a data set like this and we we'll use um, some smoothing techniques to look at that data and try to find out what the real pattern is going on in the vineyard. If you're just collecting bin weights and not using a yield monitor, you know, she's showing here that your resolution is lower or if you're using a gondola, which, you know, will hold several tons, um, you're gonna get lower resolution. So it's gonna be tougher to, to get a good yield map off of those. Um, and this is what a typical yield map looks like when we're done. Um, and what do we use that for? Okay, so let's just bring it back to the beginning and talk about measure model manage. Again, like Kevin was saying, you can use a yield map to do some very simple auditing of your vineyard. Um, again, we're doing a lot of work with crop estimation and the only real way to validate that crop estimation at the end of the season is to get a calibrated yield map to see where we, we actually were. Um, and I mean, growers are gonna use yield maps for several, just, it depends on the size of your operation and what you're using it for, right? If you're a small winery, you may want a yield map to know, you know, this was the yield and potential quality coming off one section of vineyard than another, and you may wanna treat those grapes differently. You may wanna put them into different lots of wine. Um, Concord growers like to look at a yield map, especially a yield map on the fly. Um, so dare I say this, grower, Concord growers will do what we call field blending. If they run into a section of their vineyard that is high yield and low bricks and they're trying to meet a, a brick standard, they will actually shut the harvester off, go to another section or another vineyard that has lower tonnage, higher um, sugar fruit, so that they get that load in and they'll come back to the block that had heavier yield um, like the next week when it has a chance to ripen um, and hit higher quality standards and then pick it. If you're working for a large wine company, you're going to want to use use those yield maps for differential harvesting, for um, sending truck loads of grapes to different um, price point wine lines as they get to the plant. Um, and again, auditing as you're going into the next year when you're looking at what was the yield this year, how's that going to impact yield for next year, and how should I manage that vineyard? Um, again, we're using multi-layer, multi-layer, multi-layer spatial data processing. I'm gonna go take a nap when this is all done. Um, and I talk about being data agnostic, right? I don't care where the, the spatial data comes from as long as I can get the geo reference spatial data. And I'll use any information I can get to, to do that multi-data layering uh, and try to understand the picture of what's going on in the vineyard. So in this case, the picture all the way on the left where we were, there were visual observa observations of potassium deficiency in that vineyard. So we were just rating um, like you would do a lot of insect or disease ratings where you had like a scale of one to four or one to five. And as we walked through that vineyard with a, with a handheld GPS, we were logging um, what we were seeing in terms of potassium deficiency. So in that case, you know, the sensor was the, the grower's eye essentially. And, and coming up with an accurate map. Uh, Jackie talked about NDVI. We've talked about yield monitoring, uh, BRICS monitoring. So this is something we probably will not do a webinar on this year, but we are, there's, we have two pretty talented guys here and a couple very talented growers in the area. We have a friendly competition going on to see who can develop the first BRICS monitor. And we've been working um, together on this, and it looks like we're going to have a couple BRICS monitors to test out um, this, this harvest season. In fact, we started harvesting a couple days ago, and we got that BRICS monitor up and running. So it's uh, essentially collecting fruit, again, like the yield monitor as it goes across the discharge belts, and we're, and we're um, getting a, a BRICS reading off of that. And uh, that's in development. So that's stay tuned for new technology on the way. Uh, other thing that, that um, Kevin talked about, so again, measure, model, manage. The yield mapping has been a key component when we're trying to do variable rate crop load management in our Concord vineyard. So again, we've talked about variable rate management in terms of variable rate lime and fertilizer application, variable rate shoot thinning, variable rate fruit thinning. Um, again, this is a uh, an entire talk for another webinar, but we've done some pretty good work, I think, looking at variable rate crop load management. So again, we're trying to model crop loads. We're trying to model the yield to pruning weight ratio, find out where those balance numbers are for a particular variety in a particular region for a particular market. 
and be able to hit those crop load targets through fruit thinning. And that yield, of course, that yield map, having an accurate yield map really helps us be able to, to um, come up with those crop load maps and be able to predict what the fruit quality is gonna be coming out of different regions of the vineyard. Again, that's an upcoming webinar. Um, and that's, that is it for me today. So we, I think, Kim and I talked beforehand. I think the, the plan is that next month, we're going to skip the webinar. So no webinar on the second Tuesday of October. Um, there's actually a, a large digital agriculture workshop going on the Ithaca campus that we will all be attending. So we'll not be doing the webinar that day. And then the webinar after that, uh, we would like to have a webinar on the Carnegie Mellon image sensing system. So we need to talk to them, um, either getting information for them or would really love to have one of them come up or stay down there in Pittsburgh and give us the webinar from, from that location. So that is it for now. Unless people have questions, we're, we're done a little early. Um, if you have any questions, please shoot them off to Kim and we can answer them. Um, otherwise, thank you for, for staying tuned and staying awake, maybe. Um, I love listening to these podcasts when I can't sleep at night because it puts me right out. So thank you all for uh, participating and talk to you again in the next webinar. Thank you, everybody.